the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the development of Swedish armored tech during World War II, Challenge, climbing up some hills, and Metal Beasts, a compact French armored car. It's time to take a little break from the novelties. Today, in Metal Beasts, we look at the classics, the Panard Automailleuse Légère, or simply put, the AML 90. This is a French armoured car with a battle rating of 6.7, which is an excellent scout that hunts for heavy armoured vehicles. Its main weapon is a 90mm cannon with elevation angles from minus 8 to 15 degrees. On top of that, it has a pair of machine guns and smoke grenade launchers. Three crew members are packed into a small combat compartment. Behind them, there's the ammo and the engine, and a little lower, the transmission, that passes torque to all four wheels. We haven't said a word about protection, and it's no accident. The armor of this light-wheeled vehicle is purely symbolic. There's no hope that it will hold against any enemy projectiles. Your primary strategy is to shoot first. The main purpose of the AML-90 on the battlefield is reconnaissance and, of course, hunting for enemy armored vehicles. There are three types of projectiles available for the cannon. An HE shell, a smoke one, and a heat FS round penetrating up to 320 millimeters of armor. This one will be your main choice against most potential rivals. Two things that may seem unusual at first. The absence of a stabilizer and a relatively small ammunition storage. You've only got 20 rounds. On the other hand, you can always take the maximum ammo load into the fight. It's unlikely that leaving a few of them in the hangar will help you to survive a direct hit. On an ideal road, the vehicle accelerates to 91 km per hour forwards and 17 in reverse. Hence, it's able to outrun most of its allies, and if the ground isn't too loose, it will become one of the first to arrive at capture points. But on rough terrain it doesn't feel that good, and especially if it needs to ford a river or something like that. In general, it's necessary to drive carefully, avoiding even the most insignificant of obstacles. The main advantage of this armored vehicle is a combination of mobility, small size, and the 90mm cannon. The small hull is easy to hide behind a pile of rocks or debris, and thanks to the active scouting function, you can help the team without giving up your position. At least, until you get a chance to take advantage of the surprise effect and prove yourself as a tank destroyer. Although sometimes the heat of S rounds don't have enough beyond armor effect, the gun itself has quite a high fire rate. Usually it manages to disable the opponent with the first shot and then finish him off with almost no delay. Of course, this armored vehicle is excellent for the tactics that we've mentioned in the tips and tricks section about urban battles. At the very beginning of the battle, it can quickly cross half of the map and catch the opponents way before they expect to meet any resistance. Here's a quick recap of the previous episodes. Between the World Wars, Sweden managed to establish its own tank-building tradition. The Germans were looking for ways to circumvent the prohibitions of the Treaty of Versailles, and Sweden was a convenient place to build tanks away from prying eyes. It soon became clear that the Swedish industry could produce world-class armored vehicles, albeit in small series. A few years later, Landswerk created the Stridswagen M38, one of the best lightweight tanks in the world. Now light tanks are nice and successful and all, but despite all the successes, they're not enough. As we know, in the years of World War II, medium tanks had all the spotlight. 
They could already carry powerful weapons, but still remained moderately mobile. And in addition, they were cheaper than heavy tanks. When the Swedish army bought only three of the Stridsvagen M31s, the manufacturer decided to try its luck abroad. And did so quite successfully. The L60 light tank, or the future Stridsvagen M38, was very good, and the Hungarians bought the license for its production. Following this success, Landswerk began designing the Largo medium tank, considering the ideas implemented in the L60. This one also received a welded hull with protection good enough for its class as well as an advanced torsion suspension. There was no single powerful enough engine at hand, so they took two engines from the same L60. As a result, they received a good medium tank equal to the Panzer III. And although they failed to sell it, their own army became interested in the project. By this time, the frontal armor had grown to 55 mm, and it was decided to replace the 37 mm gun with a 75 mm one. That was the final form of the tank that was taken into service under the name of the Stridswagen M42. At one time, a 57mm gun was also considered to be installed, but they rejected it for very extravagant reasons. Its barrel was protruding too much beyond the dimensions of the tank, endangering ha, traffic safety. After all, there was no martial law in Sweden, and the military couldn't afford even such liberties. In early 1942, they launched mass production of this model. By the way, at first the M42 was classified as a heavy tank, at least in comparison with the light M40. But what was truly heavy was mastering it. The Swedes were unlucky enough to purchase German electrically controlled gearboxes. They weren't very reliable, and the tankers were constantly complaining about the smell of burnt wiring. So they had to install a hydromechanical ones. The engines were also different. Some tanks had two motors, while others had one, but more powerful. Nevertheless, in general, the Stridswagen M42 was quite successful and became the basis of the Swedish tank forces for many years during the war. First of all, it was used to project power. After all, the Swedes were surrounded by warring countries. Although they were trading with the Germans, the relations between them remained tense. When the Germans were about to take over one of the islands near Sweden, the Swedes began demonstratively driving around on the M42s right before the eyes of their spies. Right after, the tanks would hide round a corner and then would quickly put new numbers on them. Then the old tanks would move out in the guise of new ones, and this went on for a long while. The Germans counted more than a hundred tanks, considered all the pros and cons, and gave up their original plans. The economic Swedes used the Stridswagen M42 even after the war. Only by the 1950s did they become completely obsolete, so they were converted into self-propelled infantry support guns. Basically, they were turned into the equivalent of the Sturmgeschultz III, but with a turret. And in that role, these tanks served for another 20 years. Today, we're going to move slightly away from the usual triathlon rules. And that's because you've asked us in the comments to find out which tech is best suited for climbing hills. We won't take any extreme angles, as climbing the mountains in battle is a worthless thing to do. But there are flatter hillsides everywhere as well. We have prepared three angled surfaces, 10, 15 and 20 degrees. Let's find out who will be the fastest to climb them. Let's start with nothing less than one of the fastest machines in the game. The Italian R3 armored vehicle. During the first test, it confidently accelerates to 25 km per hour and gets to the hilltop in 45 seconds. The second one is the same. Both the speed and the time. 
but a 20 degree slope is already becoming hard. The vehicle starts climbing clumsily and even begins to roll down after a few meters. It seems that the wheelbase is completely unsuitable for such tricks. Well then, let the Caterpillar machines prove themselves. Which one of them is the fastest? The light German RU251 tank can easily reach 80 km per hour on a flat road. Let's try that one. The German's first climb is about the same as the R3 one. But on a 15 degree slope, the speed drops by half. Only 13 km per hour and the tank spends more than a minute to get all the way to the top. The same thing happens on a 20 degree slope. Confidently, but without haste, the German crew gets to the very top. But that's clearly not the limit. Let's try testing several of the most tractive tanks at once. The Leopard 2K, the T-80U, the M1 Abrams, and the VT-1-2. And here we go! On the first climb, the VT breaks away from the others. Almost 50 horsepower per ton significantly distinguishes it among other tanks, allowing it to accelerate up to 43 kilometers per hour, mind you, while driving up. In second place, we have the Leopard. The third is the Abrams. And the last one is the T-80U. On the second climb, the situation remains the same. The VT still shows the best result, and the others finish in the same order. And on the steepest slope of the three, the leader also remains the same. And here it is, the winner of today's triathlon. The second and third places are shared by the Abrams and the T-80U respectively. The Leopard is a bit behind. More suitable gear ratios on the American and the Soviet tanks allow them to storm such angles with a little more speed. As you can see, Racing records on flat roads don't help high-speed vehicles to take the lead, as soon as there's any climbing involved. Whether it's a wheeled machine or a Caterpillar-based one, on steep hills it's not enough to simply be the fastest. There, it's all about horsepower per ton, not kilometers per hour. The more powerful the engine with less weight, the easier it is to climb, and the more efficiently the tank behaves in combat on various kinds of terrain. Well, now that we've figured that out, it's time to move on to answering your questions from the comments. The first message was sent by a player called Ulfgar Septimus von Stallenberg. I would rather have the herd elements individually movable so I can put the speed, RPM and gear indicator where I can see it. Well, it sounds interesting, but let's not make promises just yet. We'll think about it. Brody Burse writes, No close combat for me. I'm practicing social distancing. <laughs> sounds great, mate. Respect for your socially responsible behavior. Then there is a message sent by Mecha G2. Great episode. The segment about the new multifunction menu in particular was really awesome. Keep it up, Gaijin. Thank you for your kind words. We're glad that the players enjoyed the innovation. We hope that the multifunction menu will make many features more convenient and free some space on your keyboard. One of the key purposes of the shooting range is presenting such innovations in the most simple and clear way. Vilma Mendez has a request for us. Can we get tutorials for the new technologies when you have them? A lot of people take a long time to find out how to use it when they arrive. This question strongly resonates with the previous one. Our shooting range is, among other things, exactly that kind of tutorial. Check out the new episodes of the show regularly, and we'll be keeping you informed about all the major changes in the game, game mechanics, new useful features, and much more. And the last message for today was written by Yo Toi. Please, Bruce, stay safe. We need you. Greetings from France. Oh, merci beaucoup. Thank you. 
for those of you who don't speak French. No, don't worry about me. I'm committed to following the recommendations of the World Health Organization and my wife. Most of our team, including me, are now working remotely to stay safe, while at the same time ensuring that our shows are regular and the game servers are stable. But please take care of yourself, stay home, and play War Thunder. Everything will be fine. Well, once again, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, which premieres every Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell button so you don't miss any new videos. Be sure to share your impressions in comments, stay safe, and leave a like. If you remember not just to wash your hands, but to clean your smartphones as well. At least from time to time. See you in exactly one week.